Bien, after this presentation of Canning Harbor, yes, I follow it in Spanish, because I, the organization took me that uh, I went it uh, speaking Spanish uh, uh, or something, so, some occasional, I, I don't know, but, uh, what, uh, but uh, I would like to present him in, in English, because uh, uh, I know that it's more best to understand thoroughly. Uh, with a translation. And uh, well, Gany Harbour is a famous architect, American architect, Chicago architect, and uh, uh, with a prestigious international recognition for his brilliant intervention in the 20th century heritage, among which are several of the main buildings in Chicago School of uh, maybe uh, from the right or uh, Mies van der Rooij. He has published several articles of lectures in various countries to explain his work and the criteria for intervention. And he's founding member of uh, Dokumumu, US, uh, USA, and uh, AEC 20th century, is the, uh, what is uh, the vice president this association is the ICOMOS, ICOMOS, uh, no, is the International uh, yes, Committee, no, Committee Scientific, Scientific Committee, uh, International Scientific Committee of uh, 20th Century Architectural Heritage. Yes, well, no? well fantastic. Well. Excuse me. Eh, una, hay un, un pen que alguien lo debe ser su propietario. Es español. Bueno, pues eh, está aquí. O sea, si alguien se acuerda que lo ha perdido, pues se lo dejamos. Aquí. In the booth, can you hear me? Well, th uh, thank you very much for that kind introduction, and thank you uh, to the organizers for inviting me to be here, my friend Fernando. And uh, it's really been a great conference so far. I'm looking forward to uh, the rest of it. Um, before I get into my, my uh, presentation, I wanted to take a quick opportunity to allow all of you to participate in an international crisis uh, of c conserving or preserving a 20th century uh, piece of heritage in my city of Chicago. There is an architect, was an architect, Bertrand Goldberg, who is quite famous for his Marina City project that many of you may know in Chicago, uh, which is not a landmark either. But this building uh, is a hospital that he did, and it was completed in 1974, and the fact that it is so recently finished is probably its biggest uh, problem at the moment. It is owned by the University, Northwestern University, which is a large, uh, important university in Chicago. And they are, uh, have already said that they are intending to tear this building down at the earliest opportunity um, in order to make way for some proposed future development of this site for research building that they have not designed nor do they have the money to build it yet. And in Chicago we have just come off 22 years of uh, having a mayor, Mayor Daley, I'm assuming that many of you have heard of him. Uh, he uh, was a very powerful mayor and he understood the importance of using heritage as a means to uh, stimulate development and he invested a lot of city money in uh, many projects in the downtown area and beyond that to uh, help encourage other development. Um, it's not clear where he would have stood on this project. He didn't take a stand before he left office, uh, but the new mayor is a man named Rahm Emanuel, who is uh, a Chicagoan and also quite well known in the United States because he was uh, President Obama's chief of staff and he left the position in the White House to come back and run for the mayor of the city of Chicago. And this will be his first, he's only been mayor for uh, about a month, and this will be his first big preservation uh, issue. 
And it's been talked about in Ron's uh, presentation, was so great to set the global context of how we deal with heritage, looking at it uh, internationally. But really, as I'm sure all of you know, local involvement is really what determines what's, what gets saved. Um, most protection is based on local law, and that's definitely the case in the United States, and I'm assuming it's true uh, in many other parts of the world. It's great to get the recognition of being on the World Heritage List, but quite frankly, in the United States, it has absolutely no value as far as protecting anything other than the symbolic value of being on the list. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in my specific uh, remarks on the projects I'm going to talk about. So anyway, I put this up here. You can, you can Google it. Uh, you see on the upper top there, you say Save Prentice Petition. I encourage you when you go home at some time to, to go on there to read about the project. And if you feel inclined to support this, all you have to do is click it and say you support it, you sign the petition, and they will add your voice to the many others that are already there. So that, that's my uh, promotion for them. see them. Yeah. Oh. Okay, so I wanted to uh, share with you today some specifics. I'm, I'm an architect, so I deal with these things on a, in a very pra pragmatic way, in a very physical way, but I wanted to try to tie in uh, this idea of protection and planning as well as the physical uh, projects that uh, I've been involved with. And while there are probably a bunch of different things I could have talked about, since I think everyone knows the work of Mies van der Rohe, I'm going to focus on three projects of his. And I've, uh, I'll get into a little bit more about the, the, the title, but I think you're all familiar with the famous quote, although I have never really found the true uh, citation for when Mies supposedly said this, but the, the, the quote is, God is in the details. So Mies uh, is an international figure, and I know that uh, he's very important to you here in, in Spain as well for the Barcelona Pavilion that he did. But he is, uh, he's larger than life, certainly. He was larger than life in his life, and now after that he has died, he's even larger in his life, perhaps, than, than he was before. And when you have the uh, incredible opportunity and uh, honor of working on a project by a master architect like Mies, it adds a layer of difficulty and uh, importance to what you're doing as an architect because you're intervening with the master. Where There was a lot of discussion just earlier about works of art, masterpiece. I don't know what you want to use. The terminology, I think, is not so important, but the recognition is important, that the, the value is that the works by uh, someone like Mies, and not every one of his works, by the way, is a, work, is a masterpiece or a work of art, but some of them are, and those uh, need to be thought about and investigated and contemplated in a way that you don't necessarily do with other uh, heritage work that you may be engaged with. And when they have a master like this who was an educator as well, his disciples uh, are everywhere, and particularly in Chicago where he was the, the leader of the Illinois Institute of Technology for so long. There are many uh, living disciples of Mies that are watching everything you do very closely. And you have to be very careful um, in understanding how they're perceiving it and how we're perceiving it. And for me, in a way, I think it's probably fortunate that Mies is now dead because Mies can't speak to us directly about what he would or wouldn't want to do. And while you have to listen to those that are concerned and interested about what they think Mies would want to do, because of course they don't know, um, although some of them we think, I don't know what the Spanish expression is, but to channel the dead, you know, to understand what's going on. Some of them think they can do that. Um, we rely most heavily on the evidence, the physical evidence, the documentary evidence, um, looking at what he left behind and trying to figure out what is the best way to engage that building 
in a way that allows it to retain the value that is attained for us as we interpret it today um, in, the, in whatever time that we are uh, working on it. It's interesting t to me in thinking back on this that, that only about 10 years ago was there this incredible resurgence and in interest in Mies. T five years before that, no one was talking about Mies van der Rohe, even in Chicago. He, he is, his legacy in Chicago and particularly at the school was something that people were trying to distance themselves. You know, we went through the postmodern period where uh, modernism was seen as being dead and getting away from that. We didn't, people were negating that. And even though uh, many of the professors that were at IIT had studied with Mies and were still there in spec, there are still some that are teaching there. Um, that, that legacy was there, but it was sort of uh, pushed down, I would say. And then there was these two huge retrospective exhibitions that were held in New York. One was about Mies in Berlin and the other was Mies in America and it was incredibly well um, orchestrated. The, the catalogs are fantastic and uh, it was really looking at the entire body of work of Mies van der Rohe in those two uh, periods of his life. And it, it, it was great because the momentum that came out of that was a really um, strong appreciation and understanding for what Mies means to us today. As I mentioned, uh, I, don't, I don't need to explain the importance of this building or the original building and the reconstruction. We could probably spend a whole hour talking about what this all means, but anyway, you're familiar with the Barcelona Pavilion. And of course, he taught at the Bauhaus in Germany. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, he inf influenced many, many architects, including the Chicago architect Bertrand Goldberg that I referred to earlier. And then he uh, left Germany in 1938 to come to the United States. Uh, there was something of a, of a battle between him and Walter Gropius about who would get to go to Harvard, and uh, Gropius won, so I guess Mies got second prize, which was to come to Chicago, and to um, head up not only the new school of architecture, but he was also given the assignment of creating a new campus plan for the newly created Illinois Institute of Technology, which despite its name is a private institution, uh, completely funded by private funds. This is the neighborhood as it looked uh, when Mies arrived. More or less, this is taken well before that, but it more or less looked the same. The only building that's still there now is in the center on the left is a, is a big red brick building that was the original uh, Armour Institute building and is still there now. This was the site that he was sort of given. Uh, I don't, there's no, yes. This is the um, old main building and this is another building that constituted the original buildings of the site. That's the, the main building, uh, which is still there and needs a lot of preservation as well. We've been working on this one for about six years. And here's one of the early plans. And he went through many, many schemes of what he saw as being uh, the ideal new modern campus. Uh, they were basically giving him a clean slate. This is in the period of urban renewal where uh, there was no hesitation in scraping away very large areas of urban fabric in order to create something new. Here is another uh, version of his idea of what this campus could be. And uh, in a format that he liked to work in was this photo montage. They would create a model and a, a, a photo montage of it. Here's another little later version, a 1947 version. And in the process of that, not only did he do the master plan of the campus, but he also designed 20, 20 buildings uh, that were actually constructed. The first of those started in the 1940s. The one in the lower right, Wishnick Hall, was one of the early academic buildings that he completed. That was the chemistry building, which has just been um, renovated as well and is now functioning as a modern chemistry laboratory building, although major portions, the outside was completely restored and major portions of the interior were also um, saved and restored. And then the, uh, the other buildings you see, the commons, is, was where the, the students would congregate and have meals and so on. Um, and I'm going to, two of the ones I'll talk about today is Crown Hall, of course, the famous school of architecture, and the Carr Chapel, Mises' only uh, religious structure. About 15 years ago, um, the university was in a very difficult position uh, financially, and they were contemplating actually abandoning this 
campus. It was in, it's on the south side of Chicago. It's a very um, poor neighborhood. It, it has been in, since the time of urban renewal. Um, it is one of the only things around there that has been uh, sort of a constant. The university did not have a lot of money. They, they, the buildings all needed a, a, an immense amount of work. They uh, uh, weren't quite really sure what to do, so they engaged a man named Dirk Lohan. Dirk Lohan is actually Mies van der Rohe's grandson and uh, very successful, very good architect uh, in Chicago with an international practice. And they asked him to create a, a master vision for the, the campus, the 2020 plan as it's known. Um, what could the campus look like by the year 2020? And that included the uh, preservation of the historic core of buildings as well as the addition of many other new buildings um, to complete the campus, if you will. And if you can think of it, uh, this, this is State Street here, and this separates the academic campus here from the side of the campus where the student life is. Um, and this building right here is where Rem Koolhaas built a new student campus building. And this is how my firm or, or myself got involved uh, in this whole campus down there because there's the, the commons building that I showed. Uh, oops, I'm sorry. Oh, what happened here? The commons building, which is on the upper left corner, this is the building that was completely engulfed, if you will, on three si or two sides by the, the new um, Rem Koolhaas building. And because the building was seen as being potentially uh, listable, it, isn't on a li it wasn't on a list, it still isn't on a list, um, but it was seen by the uh, state authorities as being potentially on the list. And because Rem Koolhaas's design included um, engaging of the, the, the train that runs over the building, if any, has that, have any of you in the audience been there? Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. There's a, there's a tunnel that's built over the train, right part of this building. That was funded by federal funds. And because it was funded by federal funds, that meant that they looked at the impact on the, um, not only the environmental resources, but the historic resources. This is the process that we have to go through in the states. And therefore, the regulatory uh, agencies got involved in deciding what could or could not happen to this potential resource. I know that sounds complicated, and it is, but it is one way that we use in the United States to help um, protect potential landmarks and to keep them from being uh, negatively impacted by federal money that would otherwise be used on a project like this. So this is the campus, give you some context. It is on the south side, a couple of miles south of the loop. Uh, it has great views towards the, no towards the north, towards the city. On the right you see this is the new um, uh, Helmut Jan uh, design dormitories. Helmut Jan also studied uh, at, at IIT. And this is the Rem Koolhaas building I mentioned. Right here is Crown Hall. And over back over here is where the Carr Chapel is. As part of our work there, and because they face this issue with the funding uh, that they occasionally have an opportunity to take advantage of, even though it's a private institution, they do occasionally get uh, funding opportunities from the federal government. They uh, were completely um, frustrated by the fact that every time they got some funding, they had to look at the resources and then react to the uh, the, the negative report, if you will, from, from, the, from the government. So we convinced them to engage in a, and embrace this idea of uh, being historically important. And they actually uh, agreed to have this made into what we call a National Register Historic District. And what that means is that by acknowledging the fact that the campus is historic, that there were other opportunities to get money in order to Put, invest into the uh, into the site, even though it's a not-for-profit as as an as a edu um, educational institution. It's a not-for-profit, which means it makes it very difficult to use money uh, that is otherwise associated with uh, tax credits and things like that. I don't want to try to get into that, other than to say that there are these complex mechanisms by which you can use uh, uh, money in a way that helps helps a not-for-profit. This, this 
building here is actually the reason that this happened. The, the opportunity existed for a private developer to engage with the university to redevelop this one building um, and that, that that then convinced them to make the whole thing a historic district. And this is good because, good for the preservationists because it means that now the whole campus is, is looked at directly as a historic site and it gives the university an opportunity to market the whole place, if you will, as a historic site. And they have taken advantage of that. They have created a separate entity uh, called the Mies Society, which is specifically a fundraising tool, an association that raises money specifically to spend on the great works of Mies on the campus. And although they uh, never have enough money, it does give them the opportunity to raise some money to fund some of these projects. So that's sort of the context uh, of looking at, the, at the, the university itself. But what I wanted to talk about you, with you today is this whole idea of, of what was in the master's mind and how do we try to figure that out uh, in engaging these buildings today and what actually does happen to that value uh, when you have to make a change. Because as was pointed out several times already, it's, it's I think it's impossible to to completely preserve these things, uh, and by that I mean as a pickle, uh, you know, to make it into something that is not changeable, that is forever as it always was. Um, no matter what you do, these things are, are uh, these things meaning the buildings, are susceptible to change, whether that's change from the, from the environment, from the weather conditions, or from more specific uh, economic needs, or use changes, or code changes, um, there are many different things that are influencing how these buildings get treated um, and periodically, of course, they, they need to be updated and that's when, primarily when the main opportunity comes to engage them in a way and that's when the, the significant changes occur. I'll just uh, acknowledge the fact that Gene Summers is in, in this picture. Gene Summers was one of those leading disciples of Mies, probably the best, I think, the best architect uh, the, in the Miesian tradition. And he's still alive, he lives in California. He is available by phone sometimes to discuss uh, the projects that he was involved with. And, and he had a very free reign on some of the projects he worked with Mies as being sort of the lead designer, if you will, although Mies always had a hand in whatever was coming out of his office. And I'm not sure what they're doing here, but it sure looks like they're looking at the detail. This is, that was a detail, by the way, of the Seagram's building. And, uh, uh, we know that they've, they've found God on that project. So looking at Crown Hall, um, one of the master's masterworks for sure, uh, it was uh, his, his exploration and his, his first true manifestation of his idea of universal space. This is an idea that he had been working on for many, many years and uh, was finally given this opportunity to create a very personal uh, expression of a building, not, not just for a client, but he was his own client. Uh, he was, you know, the leader of the School of Architecture. This was going to be his own house, so to speak. And uh, the relationship of, of, of Mies to the class, classical architect Schinkel, I think, is well documented by many historians. And this image, these two images, make that relationship, I think, quite clear. And here we have the universal space. Um, and it, and it is amazing to me that a building that was created for a school of architecture, which I believe at the time it was created in the mid-1950s, had approximately uh, 70 students. It was definitely under 100 students. Now there are 700 students. Uh, in, in similar to what was described about this school of architecture here, of course, the numbers are smaller, but the impact is still great. Uh, they, they still house the majority of the undergraduate students in this building and uh, they, they use it very strongly. It has uh, issues about how to maintain the building. The dean, Donna Robertson, is very engaged in thinking about the importance of the building. She was instrumental in uh, making sure that, that the, the building was recognized as a historic building and that um, it be treated accordingly. Now, the... Uh, the recognition for this building has been put in place. It is a city of Chicago landmark, which means it is fully protected. 
and that any time you apply for a building permit, which is really the mechanism in the United States how, how they control this, it has to go through um, the review of the Landmarks Commission to make sure that anything you do to it meets their approval. It also is listed on the National Register as a National Historic Landmark. This is the highest level that we have in the United States of giving a building recognition. Again, it's mostly an honor. It doesn't really have any specific uh, protection unless there are monies that are coming from the federal government that would affect that. Uh, this is an iconic image. We, there was some discussion yesterday about this idea of icons and what are we restoring. Um, as an architect, I find these images extremely important because I do think that uh, the value that we uh, uh, put on the building as an icon is very, very important. And that the, the reason that we're saving it and the reason we want to understand it and the reason that we want to be as meticulous as we can in the way that we restore a building like this is so that that iconic image can be understood, of course, in our own context of today, but also in relationship to the way that the building was originally created and it was originally disseminated. And these photographs are extremely important in understanding how this building had an impact internationally on architects all over the world that never got to Chicago to see it, but they saw what it was that Mies created and it still affected how they were thinking about uh, Miesian modernism. These two, these are also building, uh, photographs taken by Hedrick Blessing that were taken at the time um, and were important to us in helping craft the, uh, the uh, restoration attitude and the idea of the aesthetic importance of this building. This is the way that the building looked in uh, 2003. The university, uh, again, this is at the time when they have no money. They're thinking about leaving. Um, they, they made the decision to stay and to embrace this heritage. They got a large uh, private grant from a very rich individual to reinvest in the campus. They had to match that, and they did. Uh, I think it was uh, $20 million. And so they had, they had $40 million to invest. But they have uh, about 35 buildings that had to get money for it, and Crown Hall was only one of them. Um, they used very creative ways to find other funding sources. One of them was from the Getty Foundation that uh, gave them a grant to prepare what we call a historic structure report. And this is a very important first step in understanding the, the artifact, the heritage, if you will, to do a very detailed history and understanding of the physical fabric of the building um, we often try to get owners to do these reports. They're very expensive, and it's very difficult sometimes to convince an owner of the importance of that. But in this case, it was mandatory uh, for, to get the money from the Getty in order to create, this, uh, uh, to create this report. So that was the impetus to do that. The first project that came out of that was to address the deterioration that had occurred on the... Um, the, uh, the front stairs. And uh, here's where, again, the, the, voice, the voice of the dead master comes to fore and speaks to you through his disciples. And in this case, it was a direct relationship from uh, Mies to Joe Fujikawa. Now, Joe Fujikawa not only studied with Mies in Crown Hall, but he also worked for Mies for many, many years and was one of the architects, a key architect that was given the responsibility of uh, overseeing the construction of many of his apartment buildings. And we'll talk about 860 as well, which had much more of Joe involved than, uh, than, than this project. But he also worked on Crown Hall. And so that's a very valuable resource. You have the man who was there at the time the building was done. And what was Joe ad adamant about? Joe was adamant that we replace the travertine of the steps with granite. Because, of course, if Mies were alive today, Mies would use granite. However, Mies isn't alive today, and Mies used travertine. And all the images that I showed you before, all the iconic imagery that we had before, the steps were made of travertine. And we know that travertine was incredibly important to Mies, not just for Crown Hall, but he used it at the Farnsworth House. He used it 
and many other projects used it at the Barcelona Pavilion. Travertine had a lot of uh, value to him. It had this relationship to Rome, to, to, to history, and to other things that were very complicated. He didn't always articulate that, but it's very clear that there were these relationships. He used it for the plinth. Um, very clear that the travertine was not just the material that he picked. Now, it may be true that if Mies were alive today, he would say, ah, the travertine, it didn't weather very well. It, it is deteriorated. That was maybe a bad choice. Let's use granite. But he's not. And so we have the decision to make as the conservation architect, what do we do? And in our case, it was very clear to us, the, 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 even though the authenticity of the phys physical material itself is not there because it was past the point of protection or consolidation or anything you might think of doing to the stone to save it, we had to replace it. But we replaced it in the same material, travertine. And again, it will have to be, rep even though the detailing has, was changed to provide for better drainage, et cetera, 30 years from now, it'll probably have to be replaced again. Just like when you paint the building and you paint an exterior building, the exterior of a paint of a building is something that you know will need to be replaced. You can't preserve it for all time. You have to think about these things as a cyclical uh, renewal, of you, if you will, of whatever that material is. And yes, stone has more permanence, but it's not forever. It has to be thought about as something that has to be renewed. These are some more pictures of the condition of the building. Um, while the vines are beautiful, and, and Mies was very interested in the relationship of landscape to the building, the physical relationship, uh, and he supposedly liked the vines growing on the building, the buildings don't like the vines growing on them because they are very uh, damaging to the physical fabric of the building. And this is the dean's office where the vines are actually growing inside the building. <laughs> and you can see on the out, uh, this is on the inside of the building and uh, the deterioration that occurred primarily through condensation. Um, because it's a steel building, they didn't understand the relationship of needing to separate the outside from the inside and, and the idea of the cold steel in the wintertime collecting moisture on it and causing uh, long-term exposure to moisture, which leads to deterioration. So um, after the preparation of that report, a firm called Crick and Sexton uh, was engaged along with myself. I was then working for uh, another firm, McClear, um, but I was engaged as the conservation architect to work with Crick and Sexton to come up with the, the, the restoration design for the exterior of the building. Um, there was only enough money to do the outside. There was also a master plan done uh, to figure out how we could make uh, Crown Hall more sustainable. This is just at the beginning of this whole sustainability craze. The dean coined the phrase, the greening of Crown Hall. How can we make it more green? Uh, not with vines, but with more uh, sustainable approaches to the building envelope. And we hired, uh, or she hired, some very good uh, uh, sustainable uh, consultants uh, that were actually European, Atelier 10 and uh, uh, Transolar. Uh, Transolar, I believe, is a German firm, and T Atelier 10 is both German and, and British. But anyway, they were, they were great. We had a really good team collaboration. And of course, the first thing they wanted to do was to replace the single glass, the single glazing, with double glazing. Can we use double glazing? And the answer was no. Uh, while, while I have worked on projects, and even, even in the Wishnik call, which I showed earlier, that has been um, re, re, remade with double glazing. In the case of Crown Hall, it would have changed things uh, irreparably. It would have really changed the basic fundamental meaning of the building in many, many ways. Um, and so we said, no, we have to come up with another solution, uh, understanding that this building will never perform as well as it might if you built it today, but it can still perform better than it was performing. I should mention that in the 1970s, I think it was in 76, the building underwent a major renovation where all the original glass was replaced with new glass and in this case, they used uh, a laminated glass instead of the original sandblasted glass uh, for the lower lights. 
And this actually had a negative impact on the energy of the building because of the way that the performance of uh, the laminated glass work in, in is, I don't want to get into all the technical details, but it was complicated in the way that it holds the heat when the sun hits it and so on. So by getting rid of that, we actually were able to make an improvement in the performance of the, of the building. The glass itself is a huge issue on any modern building, um, particularly an iconic one like this. And you can see here on the left, this is in Crick and Sexton's office, we had probably three times this many different uh, forms of glass that we looked at as possible replacements. Uh, and then we, we narrowed that down to three different options, which you see we did as a full size uh, mock-up, what we call mock-ups. And those mock-ups for us are critical in the path of understanding what is the best choice. Uh, we made the different, and you can see that whether you view it from the inside, this is inside looking out, this is the outside looking in, and in particular, this, this, these two pieces here are very different from the inside than from the outside. From the inside, it's not so bad. From the outside, it's unacceptable. At the end of the day, the best uh, choice was to go with the sandblasted glass, the original Miesian design. So that was good because it worked on both levels. But we had to change the detail. And uh, this was discussed for weeks. Uh, there, was a, there was a committee within the school created by some of the professors who knew Mies. Uh, Ron Crick, who was a Miesian, um, did not like this solution. He wanted a more angular solution. It was sacrilege to put an angle in a Miesian building because everything had to be 90 degrees. Nonetheless, we convinced them to try the mock-up, and when we did the mock-up, they were satisfied that, in fact, you can't really see it, so therefore, they accepted it. Then we went through the construction. In this case, it was 15 weeks. We only had 15 weeks when the school was out of session. Uh, we have Dirk Lohan, Mises' grandson, and his great-grandson had the honor of the first smashing of the glass. Again, it's not historic glass because it had already been replaced once, and that set off the project. Uh, when we started to take it apart, we could see how bad it really was, how the deterioration had occurred. We had to take all the, all the paint off down to the bare metal. Uh, again, loss of historic fabric, if you will, by removing the paint, but it's the only way to get at a longer term solution. We were very careful in the process of monitoring how the new paint was applied. And again, it's not the original paint system, it's using modern technology to uh, the best of our ability to get a paint system that'll last as long as possible. And then the installation of the new glass, which was probably the trickiest part of the whole thing. Uh, very large pieces of glass that had to be installed. I should mention that the reason that the detail had to be changed was dictated by the change of the code. Uh, there was a requirement in order to have enough uh, coverage of the glass, the bite, they call it, in order to make sure that the glass is held in its place. And that required an enlargement of the, of the angle of the end of the glass that was actually engaging the glass. That's why we had to change it. And here you see the finished uh, product. Returning the icon to that original image. The 860-880 Lakeshore Drive, this is uh, Mises' first realization of his steel and glass high rise. He did do the Promontory Apartments, which was a concrete building. Um, but this was his first ability to express the high rise in steel and glass. These again are these original iconic images which had an, a profound impact all over the world and everybody started copying it immediately. Here are the buildings going up and again we wanted to, we, we did not have the luxury of, of the owner willing to pay for an in-depth study but nonetheless we needed to look at the original information. We could get the drawings, the photographs, and so on, in discussion with people that are still alive that remember it. Here they are installing the, the uh, system. And there is a great quote from Joe Fujikawa, again, who was interviewed about this some years ago, who said that they were incredibly naive. They did not understand how a tall building was going to perform. 
and therefore uh, did not understand that when you build a tall building, negative air pressure has an incredible impact on the way the building actually functions. And as soon as they finished building this building, every time it rained, it would suck the air in and everybody would have a flood in their apartment. So, uh, because they didn't, they didn't understand that they needed to completely make the perimeter of the window systems tight, which they then did, and that's still how it functions today, although that's not really the way we would, would try to do it uh, ideally today. Again, more iconic images. In this case, the lighting, which was also restored. Um, but the big issue for us was two things. One is the, um, it's the storefront system and the plaza itself. And you can see the water on the plaza and the paint that was on the building. Now, the paint was beginning to fail. Uh, you see here it was wholesale failure. The, the, it's beginning to, to rust. The, the steel is corroding. We did some testing. Uh, with Jenny Elsner was the uh, forensic uh, firm that did the testing on here. They're, they're seeing how much life is left in the paint system. How many times can you paint it before the whole thing starts to, to peel off the building? And they determined that we could, yes, paint it at least one more time, maybe two, uh, before they would have to completely remove all the paint like we did at Crown Hall, which would be much more expensive than this was. We did mock-ups to agree on what we were doing. The color and uh, the sheen of the new paint system had to be similar to what the original paint was. You can't get the original paint because of the, the uh, laws relative to using lead in paint, so we had to go with a different system. Um, and then that the building was painted in due course. So that, that was probably less interesting than this plaza issue. Again, travertine does not function well in the Chicago environment of bad winters with a lot of ice forming in the stone. And you can see the result uh, here. And these are actually replacement pieces. They've already been replaced once and they still don't function very well. Part of the problem is that in that Miesian ideal of making the plaza as flat as the top of this podium, uh, some places it's not flat. In fact, you have a negative valley, and in this case, the water sits here, and, as, and it sits along the storefront, and as a result, you get corrosion down below. And this is a parking garage below where you have people with their Mercedes parked, and when the big chunk of concrete falls on the Mercedes, they're not happy. So they knew they had to fix this, uh, and uh, just repairing this wouldn't be enough. We had to go in and completely take out the existing paving. Another problem, this is, uh, what, seven centimeters, eight centimeters, which is not enough room to put, put the stone in a proper bedding, which is part of the problem for the whole system. Um, and now we are limited in how can we fix that going back again. This was the detail that we had to change. Looking at the travertine, how do we uh, come up with a, 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 a material, again, that will work? So we went back to the same travertino in, in Italy to get the, the, uh, the right match. Um, and, but the big change was in the drainage of the plaza. And Crick and Sexton was very clever in figuring out how we could do this with new subsurface drains. Originally, there was only one drain for the whole plaza. And we retained only one visible drain for the whole plaza, although we moved it slightly. Uh, but all the other drains are below surface. And this is the detail how you can see that that's been done. So we don't have all these drains all over the plaza that would be visually uh, obtrusive. Here we are matching the stone. We went through a lot of effort to try to get as close as we could to that. And these are deep, this is the original detail on the left. Uh, then you have the modification occurred in 1981 where they actually did work on the plaza and rebuilt the storefront, but they didn't fix the problem. Here's an original image. There were revolving doors that were added in uh, probably about six or seven years after the original building, um, and those were still there, so we retained those. This was the uh, condition prior to, and the problem really is this steel that's just below the surface of the of the stone, but the problem is, is that this ideal of having this be a continuous surface or an image of a continuous surface was what was really creating the problem and not having enough room right here. And that caused the deterioration of all this underlying steel. I should say that this storefront was replaced in 81 from aluminum to stainless steel. That was a decision that was made long ago and we didn't have the money to go back to the aluminum system, so we left the stainless steel because we were only replacing a part of it. Uh, 
Uh, here you see again some of the conditions were terrible. They had to go, it was like having a, a bad tooth. You had to go in and take it out and fix it right. And we had to change the detail. Here, here we raised the outside just about, uh, what is that, seven, eight centimeters in order to allow for more of a bed and get the drainage, positive drainage, off the surface of the, of the, tra of the plaza. And we had one issue of how do you deal with the entrance, and we were able to, to slope it down a little bit to do that. Then these are the repairs going on. Uh, some places we had to go all the way through the concrete and put new uh, steel in in order to reinforce it. And then once that was fixed, then we had to lay the, the, the new travertine. And almost all the plaza was replaced with new travertine. Again, much of it had been replaced over the years, so we, uh, uh, we were only replacing about 60% of the original material, but it was still a loss of original fabric. Um, we had to match the grout. These are all things you do as of course. This is where the, the storefronts were being restored and then new glass being installed. We had to replace the glass again because uh, of a law. The law does not allow for the reuse of a glass like that. When the men take out the glass, it has to be thrown away. That's the law. Uh, it's a complicated to explain why, but anyway, that's the law. Here they are refinishing, and the, and the issue here was that we had to replace travertine along the perimeter on the inside as well as on the outside. So trying to get this to match well was uh, a big deal. We had winter conditions, which made it much more difficult. I'm trying to go fast because I have one last one I want to uh, talk about as well. But this made the, the uh, you know, these building conditions are sometimes things that don't get thought about very much. But when you have a schedule, uh, that can very much dictate the way that things get done on the construction site, which can affect the outcome of the project. It's less than ideal conditions. And here is the plaza completed. Uh, again, this is an original image and replacing the, we also replaced this, this railing here. But you can see that the idea of this travertine plane has been recreated. And the idea of the, of the, of the lobbies that he had made, um, very clean and pristine with the, with the Mesian furniture. These are pictures I just took uh, the project was completed a couple of years ago, and I just took some pictures the other day to see how it's, how it's faring, and the, the travertine is holding up quite well. And this is an image to show. This is a place, actually, where when you look very closely, you can see that there is a slight change in the slope. It's not completely flat. Um, and when it rains here, the water does flow into the drain, which is what it's supposed to do. But when you, when you take a casual look at it, there's no impact on your visual image of this as being a perfectly flat plaza. And the same thing at the perimeter, there's no change in elevation, even though there is a significant uh, seven, eight centimeter difference between the inside and the outside. From your visual view standing inside, you can't see that it isn't one plane. It's still that, that idea of the single plane is there. And here you have original fabric that has been reinstalled uh, in, in a place that's probably the least traveled, um, both for um, its, its long-term protection, but also its visual impact. Because no matter how hard you try to match the original stone, there is a difference. And so we are acknowledging the fact that this is a replacement. And that's on the, the one on the left is on the inside, where the, the difference is less apparent, but still there. And on the outside, it's more apparent due to the different characteristics when the stone weathers. So, looking heavenly, and Mises still looking at heaven too. Uh, I wanted to just talk about the last one, which is uh, Car Chapel. And this is the only religious structure that Mises uh, was able to have constructed. It's a very small building. This ha I didn't mention that the 860 building um, is also a city of Chicago landmark, which means it is fully protected by the local ordinance. This building is not protected at all. The only thing protecting Carr Chapel is the recognition by the university that this is one of Mises' most important buildings on the campus and must be treated as if it is a landmark. So it, it is not uh, legally protected, but it is protected by their understanding of how important this building is 
to them as an owner and as a steward of uh, the legacy of Mies. These are the iconic images. The students call this the God box because it's such a simple little uh, box of a building and it, it houses God in there. And of course now it has to function as a multi-denominational uh, uh, place of worship. There is an issue of the cross hanging. The, mu the Muslim students don't like that so sometimes they cover the cross uh, when they have a service in there or if they use it for some other function. Um, but nonetheless, it was created as an Episcopalian uh, denomination, but with the idea that it could be used by all. This is what it looked like, again, deteriorated, not very well maintained. You can see uh, the steel is corroding. This is what happens when you throw a lot of salt in the wintertime. And by the way, this is granite, so Mies did use granite sometimes. <laughs> that made that decision easy. We were able to reuse the granite. The aluminum doors were um, very badly deteriorated. And the biggest problem was in the roofing, and this is where we had to change the detail. You see the, the, the tear in the roof, there's things growing on the roof, they don't maintain the drain of the roof, and that causes problems on the inside of the building. There had been, uh, because this building was a, is built as a masonry bearing building uh, with no expansion joints in it, it meant that there's funny movement in the way that the building behaves. And the top of the building has this steel ring, uh, which you see here, and it sits on top of the masonry, and they move it a different, different, uh, in different amounts depending on the temperature and so on. And that has caused some problems at the top of the building, uh, particularly at the joint where the, the masonry meets the steel. This is a change, a, a replacement that was made 20, 30 years ago, I'm not sure exactly when it's not documented when they did it. And you can see the match is not very, very good. Here's the detail uh, from the original drawings. This is just a steel channel that runs around. It's welded together. Uh, very simple idea. It doesn't function very well. There's not much we can do about that because we weren't going to completely replace this. And one of the biggest problems with it, here's this detail here where they, they need good sealant. But the problem is, is that there's not enough slope in the roof. And also, uh, uh, the, um, not only the way that the ceiling has worked here, but the, um, the fact that, that uh, there's no covering here. The, I'll show, go back to the detail in a second. But we had, to add, we had to do something. So we added a piece of steel here. And I have to say that I've never really been satisfied with this as the solution, but it was the most practical one we could come up with in the time frame we had to do the project and with the money that we had to spend on the project. So this is the solution that we made. Other things that had to happen was the doors, as I mentioned, they were, they were beyond being repaired. We didn't have the money to spend two or three times as much as the new doors cost, so the decision was made to replace the doors. But we did decide and we were able to save the hardware. Um, this should have been up located a little higher, but that was a mistake by the contractor. But rather than make a hole in the door, we left it where it was. However, about uh, three months ago, I got a call from the, from, the, from the project manager at the university. He said, Gunny, you're not going to like this, but the, uh, the, building, the building maintenance people found that the handles were loose, and so they fixed it. And this is how they fixed it. So now we're, now we're faced with the problem, do we leave it alone? Or do we take them out and then have to patch the holes where the screws are and all these kinds of things? So for now, we're leaving it alone. But it's not something we're happy about. But you have to be careful because the maintenance of the building needs to be always thought about. And even though they're very, the, 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 the people we work with are very conscious of it, it just takes one guy in the afternoon to go out and do something stupid. And then you have to live with the consequences of that. Here you see the, the change. Um, we got rid of this thing, which was very ugly, and it was an afterthought that they had added to try to fix the same problem. And we got rid of that, so we have the clean line of the outside, and then we have this little thing peeking over the edge, which is not perfect, but nonetheless, it's still there. Here you see, again, this is the before, the historic, iconic image, and the way that it sits on the site today, the God Box. Um, and now we're just starting now, uh, this summertime, we are going to restore the inside of the building, which is really mostly cleaning it up. 
Uh, this is an image taken from the 1970s. It looks basically the same. The one change that we were proposing is to put a handicap or a, a, a universal access toilet in the building. I would say fortunately, uh, they don't have the money to do that right now, so we don't have to make that intervention. Um, but if we do, and when they do, this is the way that we propose to do it, which was always sort of the core of the building was here. Um, there was a little bathroom here, which I have a, this, this is the bathroom, you can't get a wheelchair in there, it's unacceptable uh, for usage that way, but since we can't do anything, we're gonna leave it for now. Um, the main thing on the inside is cleaning all that, that deterioration from the leaking over the many years, and also to, to restore this woodwork. Now, the contractor wants to replace this because that's the easiest thing to do, it's very simple, but we are treating this as more like art or furniture, I would say, and so we are retaining as much of this as we can and piecing in the veneer to match, uh, and we know someone who is, th th the problem is you need to find the right craftsperson, the person that can actually do the work, and we have a conservator who's very good, and when we're done, we'll have 95% of the original material and where we have to add uh, the little bit down here where this is completely uh, unfixable and up at the top, that will be pieced in with some new material. The lighting, this is very cheap. This, this is lighting that was bought in the hardware store. This is not anything fancy, but we're keeping it and we're going to reuse it uh, with new lamping in it to match the original intent. And the last thing I want to mention is the landscape because as I said, it was very important to Mies, the understanding of the relationship of his very hard and pristine uh, formal vocabulary in a beautiful natural landscape. And he worked with a architect, landscape architect, uh, Alfred Caldwell, who came out of the Jens Jensen Prairie School tradition, um, but nonetheless embraced modernism in a very direct way. And they worked a lot on many projects and he did a master plan for the campus. And this is his plan, uh, which was never fully executed, but mostly executed. And so there is an idea of trying to um, fulfill the, the, the plan, particularly down in this, this area here, to plant this out in a way where the building was intended to be um, relating to a green area in the front of the building, which uh, was never fully realized. And so we like to think that, that, that although we've had to make some changes and to alter what it was that Mies was trying to achieve uh, in his design and particularly in the details, that he would be, uh, that the ghost of Mies can rest uh, in a satisfactory way that we have been at least careful in our thinking about how we approach and what kind of changes we make. So thank you.